So what, are you and John Terry good now? No, no. Graham Sunis made a statement about putting medals on the table. Boy, listen, mine has got a World Cup medal with his medal. Mm. Like, I'll just check for someone who's got a World Cup <laughs> If I was Paul Pogba, I'd said the same thing. But I would have said it from a disrespectful standpoint because I've been saying, you've been dissing me all this time, I've not kicked the ball. Why are you talking about me for? Emil, man, he, his big self just fell on <laughs> <laughs> First of all, it's the best partnership ever in Premier League history. Trust me. Russia could be like, I'd be the best, 100%, because he's just got mad talent. If I was a fan going to watch a game, I'd pay to watch Gerard. If I was a manager, I'd probably pick Lampard. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to yet again another episode of the Beautiful Game podcast. As ever, I'm your host, Butch. Joined by my fellow South Londoners, my co-conspirators, <laughs> How are we doing, boys? I'm good, bud, man. I'm excited for this one. Obviously, growing up in Peckham, SE15, Friary Road, I'm sure Rio knows it. Yeah. This is, like, very special for me. And obviously, I went to the same primary school as Rio, and all the teachers in class used to say, if you want to be the next Rio Ferdinand, you have to listen in class. So <laughs> it's an absolute privilege to have you on the podcast, bro. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks. So. It's been a long time. We've been chatting over this for a while now, haven't we? So yeah, yeah, Rio. We've been speaking a lot, and this is emotional. You know, back in the day, I used to play at Dalit Chamler under Gavin the FA Youth Cup, and I remember one day there was a game against Enfield, and you actually came down to the game. I think we were drawing one-one at half time. Yeah, yeah. Gav gave a team talk, read out the riot act. Then you came in, and you're like, "Boys, come on, man. You're better than that, man. There's some scouts watching." <laughs> and obviously we left the room and we were sort of like nudging each other saying wow Rio Ferdinand came into the dressing room we ended up pamming the team like 4-1 <laughs> so that just shows like the influence that you've had on our generation so big up and love for coming on wow nice 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 fantastic good. stuff man right so as is customary on our platform of course we always have to uh, give our special guest uh, an introduction so uh, the, the guy that we've got on uh, uh, on the podcast today is a, a full time dad and a retired ballet dancer who had a, an unblemished boxing career with zero losses, zero <laughs> wins and zero fights. He's a, a fitness influencer who keeps busy uploading videos of his uh, home workouts with his missus on Instagram and YouTube. I'm also told um, he uh, kicked the ball about uh, a, f- a few different parts of the of his life, apparently. <laughs> anyway, no, seriously, we, we welcome a, a, a gentleman who was capped 81 times for England and was part of uh, three World Cup squads. He's one of the most decorated uh, English footballers of all time, uh, having won 14 trophies uh, with Manchester United, which included six Premier League titles and a Champions League too. He's widely regarded as one of the best centre-halves to ever play in the Premier League due to his elegance, poise and... One of, one of... One of the best. The, the best, best, man. The best. The best. Come on. <laughs> He's, of course, praised for his ability to read the game and his strong leadership qualities. A real force to be reckoned with uh, on the pitch and, of course, in the tunnel. And so, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome Rio Ferdinand to the platform. Big up, big up, big up, big up, big up, big up. Big up. Some intro, that. That's some big intro, boy. <laughs> Right, so we're raring to go. Honestly, I think we, uh, we almost broke our uh, Twitter uh, account when we uh, posted yesterday that we were going to be uh, <laughs> chatting with you and we asked a load of listeners to, um, to share their, their, their questions with us. And of course, we were inundated with so many of them. And so before we kick things off, we just want to let all of the listeners and viewers know we're going to try and incorporate as many of your questions as possible into the podcast. As you can imagine, we've been hit up with so many we're not going to be able to cover all of them but we're going to try and do our best of Mm. course we value you guys you guys have helped us along our journey you know our short journey up until this date um and and so you know we're we're going to do our best to 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 fire those questions over to to rio so we're going to kick things off now obviously rio as as we've obviously um already uh, mentioned you were born and bred southeast london uh grew up in peckham and we've uh, recently uh, done an interview with Mark Bright. He's obviously an ambassador down at uh, Palace. And he was speaking about the work that they're doing in terms of building 
um, the academy base and, and that kind of thing, right? And he spoke about the fact that I think it was 11 or 12% of the players in the Premier League come from the southeast um, London area, uh, catchment mm. area. Mm. And so I guess the first question I want to ask you is, what, what is it about South London? Um, why is it that such a large percentage of, of players that are playing right at the top uh, uh, um, level now are coming from, from, from South East London? Yeah, it's mad because I was just starting to film a documentary about this. You know that. It's funny you talk about that straight away. The first question, I was just filming about a documentary about, it's like a six mile radius even of people, that players that you've got like um, Gomez, Tammy Abraham, Hudson Adoy, um, Sessignon, um, well, listen, there's nothing, there's loads of them, Sancho, um, that are all come through that, all playing in the Premier League and, you, and for England as well. And you're thinking, wow, how can it just be like this hotbed? Why? Who, who started it? Why has this come about? It's just, I don't know, because listen, you've got South London, you've got East London, North London, West London. There's pockets in each of them different areas that are very similar to, to South London. Like uh, you, you could go Peckham, you can go Harlesden, you can go Hackney. Like it's, it's these areas. They're different names, but they're very much similar in a lot of ways, and they all produce good players. Like you have got play, Sterling from like I think he's from like West London side, isn't he, Sterling? Yeah, like you Wembley. Way. Diff- yeah, you got different. You got Wembley in it, so you got players from different areas. But you just think like, wow, this is it is a madness that London's producing so many players and so much talent at the moment, and it's just. I, I don't know if you can put your finger on one thing and say, this is it, this is the reason. But there's been examples, like when I was coming up, Ian Wright was my a guy who I could associate with and think, oh, um, another person, a black person, come from a similar background to me, that's an inspiration. Like, so I might be that for some other kids, my brother, other players, etc. I might be that for the next generation coming through now, maybe, you don't know, but... I think the more the, the young players see people from similar backgrounds, the more they can feel, right, this is touchable, I can do this. Yeah, so Rio, as you mentioned, South London's a hotbed of talent. You've got your mate Gavin Rose, the manager of Dalit Chamlet. Mm. We've seen the likes of the Cowley brothers get opportunities to go to Braintree, Lincoln, Huddersfield now. Why don't you think Gavin's been given the opportunities? Because he's producing talent. Ethan mm. Pinnock, he's at Brentford. George Ella Colby. He played in the Premier League for Wolves. Mm. And you've got some others. So why don't you think Gav's being noticed as well? Well, I don't know, man. I always ask this question. And I just think like, I, I, to be honest with you, I think Gavin's had a couple of people ask him to do certain jobs, but then it, the, the jobs haven't been as probably satisfied, like satisfying for him as what he does now. And um, I do think Gavin deserves opportunity. I think there's the, the amount of players that Gavin gets and brings back into football, but also changes their life in terms of the way they look at things and their perspective of life is a huge thing that I think will be a massive asset. Just not just him, him and Cads. Yeah. They're like, they'll, they'll be a massive asset for a club. If I was Palace, West Ham, Charlton, I would take them now. I would, if I was in them clubs, I'd take them because there, ain't no, there, there won't be many people in them football clubs that can talk to, the, to them kids on the level that Gavin and Kaz can get down at. So, and engage and keep them kids motivated in that way. And like, I'm sure every one of them clubs will have stories of, of young players who have had different upbringings to most people, very challenging uh, at home, like lifestyle at home, that have slipped through the net. And I don't think, I think with Gavin and, and someone like Kaz and the other guys they've got working with them, them, them kids wouldn't be allowed to slip through the net like that so easily. There will, there, there will be another opportunity for them kids based on what Gavin and Cad's their experience and what their backgrounds are and how they can touch these kids differently. Rio, I want you to, you know, take us back to, you know, Peckham. Obviously, mm-hmm. I remember the adventure playground, um, Leighton Square. Obviously, my brother used to kick ball, Vanton. Um, obviously, Daniel Morris, all those guys. So just take us back Scott, to those days. All of them. Yeah. Yeah, how, how were those days? Yeah, listen, whenever, I always say this, whenever one anyone talks to me about my childhood and things, and a lot, a lot of people, they, they first will talk about it, like, especially when you do mainstream media, oh, it's always a negative connotation, like, the, it was very hard, it must have been very hard for you back then. But listen, when anyone mentions my child, I just start smiling, because it was the happy times. You're carefree, you're around all your friends. I've got a WhatsApp group of about 10, eight, eight, 10 of us, of my best friends who I grew up with when I was young, mm-hmm. from, from, the, from the estate. And we're always saying in there, and that if you look at the mix of 
of um, backgrounds in that in that group. You've got an Irish boy, a Turkish boy, a Nigerian boy, a Caribbean guys. Um, so like it's such a mix of people. We was lucky to be in a melting pot like that. So I was happy, man. I had great times. All my friends are into football, um, getting jokes. If you if if you if you if you couldn't take banter, then you couldn't be around like that. <laughs> that was a big part of it. If you you even the younger ones, Anton's generation, all them boys, Beckles, Daniel Morris, all of them, Watsi, all of them, if they they, they had to be brought up to that take banter, they had to get slapped with banter all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Fair, fair point. All right, so we're, we're, we're going to move on now. Um, and obviously, you know, we started mentioning it in, in, in the intro. We spoke about predominantly your, um, your, your time at uh, um, United, where, you know, you won so many different trophies and, 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 you know, played with some very, very top players. I guess what I wanted to ask you um, to start off with, Rio, was what your relationship was, um, was like with, with Sir Alex. Um, and... If you could, if you could choose between the two of them, who would you say was a more scary figure, uh, Sir Alex or, or Roy Keane? Oh, Sir Alex, easy. Because Sir Alex, Roy Keane ain't picking the team. He don't make, Roy Keane don't mean I can get in a team on them. Yeah. So, Sir Alex had an awe about him. Listen, Roy Keane was a great player, a great captain. Demanded off a lot of people, made sure the standards were always high. Um, and he, I was, I was, I really liked being around him. Because you, 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 to see how different people, different captains work. Do you know what I mean? David Beckham was captain of England. Very, very different from someone like Roy King. Mm. I mean, David Beckham didn't speak, didn't say a word really in terms of trying to motivate people or anything like that. He was more go out there and perform and see the way I perform and follow that, which is one way of leading. Whereas Roy King was very vocal. If you saw if something was wrong, you would be on people quick. Um, but Sir Alex was just like, he becomes like a father figure because he, he, he takes a lot of, um, he, he, he looks into the details, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like you guys, you guys might have a workforce, say for instance, one day you get to a workforce of 30, 40 people and the, the guy who's at the top who's managing it all, he knows about all of your family, he knows when your uncle's ill, when your auntie's ill, send them flowers and stuff like that. Them little, little touches there means, right, I'm coming to work today. Even when I've got a bad back or I'm a little bit ill, I'm gonna, the manager, I need to come to work because the way he cares about us, them little things, and that goes into football. And that translates into running through brick walls, that, that old saying for a manager is that he, them little details that he'd done. I don't know if it was, he knew that was why he was doing it or it just you know, it was just a part of him, I don't know. But he was just a phenomenal manager and being able to push people's buttons. And he would approach different people differently. Do you know what I mean? He wouldn't be like, treat like a blanket. Yeah, one, yeah. one rule fixes for everybody. He was like, I've got to talk to Nani like this. Wayne Rooney, I've got to talk to like that. Ryan Giggs, I've talked to. Like, everyone was different, man. So he was, he was ahead of his time in terms of his man management. He was just phenomenal the way he dealt with us. It was brilliant. Yeah, so Rio, um, obviously, Sir Alex Ferguson built a dynasty at Manchester United. Mm -hmm. He's known as a manager that kept freshening it up every three or four years to make sure to keep that winning mentality intact. So which player that left the club were you surprised that raw Salix just sold him? Like, I can't believe it. Mm. Probably Ruud van Nistelrooy. I think Ruud, when, when I was there, he let Beckham go, um, Veron, van Nistelrooy, Diego Forlan. Um, uh, Diego went on to win the European Golden Boot, man. Like he went on to big and really done done really well. But he had like Rooney, um, Solskjaer, Van Nistelrooy in front of him, and it was obviously it was a hard thing for him to have to sit there and wait. But I think seeing Rude go because when I signed, Rude was the top man. He was like he come and his goal records phenomenal. He's breaking records like eight or nine consecutive games in the Premier League. Just like chances falling, bang, goal, ruthless. So when he went, it was kind of a like, wow, okay, what's the manager got in plan now? What's he, what's he got in store for us now? But I think the manager from that point was building the team around like myself, um, Rooney, Ronaldo, um, so I, and a few other players. So I just think that he just saw beyond Ruud van Nistelrooy. As much as he was a great goal scorer, I think to allow R Ronaldo and Rooney to breathe a bit more, 
and to express himself a bit more freely without the pressure of someone like Rude there because he was such a big figure in the dressing room. He needed to let him go and it was a brave call, but one that paid off in the end because we started dominating for, for a few years. But I think that one of the big catalysts for Rude leaving was the League Cup final where he was like, um, he, he didn't start the game, the League Cup final. But the manager, I think he said the manager promised that he was going to come on and then mm -hmm. he, he didn't come on. And Rude went nuts. He was going crazy on the bench, like screaming, like swearing at the manager and stuff. And I think wow. the, day, the manager was just like, you know what? Ooh, that's <laughs> yeah. Rio, this is almost like a, I would say a two part question. Um, a, how was it playing with Cristiano Ronaldo? And B, there's been a player that you've spoken on record about, you know, very highly, um, Ravel Morrison. You said that he's, you know, one of the most talented players you've ever seen come through the Man United Academy. Mm. How did his talent stack up to Cristiano Ronaldo's raw talent? And why is he, you know, like not fulfilled his potential? And is it true that you offered him the opportunity whilst you were at Man United to actually live with you so you can keep him on the straight and narrow? Mm. Yeah, I used to kind of to come to my house and that. But to be fair, so Sir Alex Ferguson told me to just, he wanted me to step away from doing stuff with Ravel because he thought the club could deal with the situation. But this goes back to my point about someone like Gavin. If Gavin was at Man United then, I don't think Ravel Morrison slips through the net. I think Ravel Morrison becomes a £100 million player. But there's not someone like that. There wasn't someone like that at Man United then. And most of the clubs around, I don't see people like that at the clubs people that are from the streets, from the estates, from a background that's similar to these young players. So they can talk to them. Like I know Ravel was sitting there chatting to someone that was sent to look after him. He was, he was like walking this guy through the park, all this, just, just chatting nonsense to this guy, to saying what he wanted to hear and then going and doing what he was going to do. So, because he could get away with it. Where Gavin or someone like that, that type of person would, would see through that stuff straight away and pull the, the boy up straight away and go, listen, calm yourself down. This is how you need to move, and that's it. So it's very, um, but it's a, it's a tricky situation because sometimes some of these kids' home lives are, are very different to, to what we all know. Um, yeah, we're all from an estate or whatever, but when you close someone's door, you don't know what goes on in them, in them in behind that door. So you have to tread carefully, and you need experience and understanding of the situations to deal with it properly to get the best out of that individual. So Ravel's talent, I've always said it, I ain't seen a kid at that age of 14 years old, 13, 14, 15 years old, like that in my life. Like, different. Like, and if you see some of the videos that he even puts up now, he sent me a couple of videos and the guy, his manager looks after him, sent me a couple of videos from training at, at Sheffield United last season. What he was doing to man was nasty still. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was getting people to sleep. Yeah, like he was doing some... Breaking mad... ankles. <laughs> I was trying to commentate on it, like, because it's just, it was just... He, the game comes so easy to him, it's effortless. Like, but this is what I talk to my kids about as well. And my little two boys want to be footballers. But I say to them, it don't matter about ability will get you so far. It's your attitude and your mentality will take you to the top and make you stay there. Because ability can get you there. Ability will get you to, the, to a club and you might get in the first team and everything. But if you ain't got the right mentality, you ain't staying there. Because there, there'll be other hungry kids coming through who are more um, attention to detail. They apply themselves more, they work harder, they haven't got any distractions, they don't allow distractions, and they'll take your place, man, because it's going to dog eat dog world. So but Ravel, man, I don't know. It's just it hasn't gone probably the way that his ability suggested it should have gone. Um, but I do feel that the press really didn't help this kid. The press were really kind of they played a, a part in tarnishing his name more than they than it should have been. Yes, he had some difficulties, but you don't just, kids like that need help. They don't need to be vilified or, 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 or put down in the media the way they had. And, and he, he, I think he unwarrantedly got a bad name at times. Because when you see people that meet him, they go, the first thing they say, oh my God, he's, he's pleasant, isn't he? He's a nice kid. You're like, what? I don't, that's the media. The media have made you get a perception straight away before you met him. So, but Ronaldo, back to your question about Ronaldo, like you've, Talent-wise, you knew he had it, but it was, again, the mentality was something that just I thought was different to all these other kids. It was just elite thinking, elite programming that you just think, whoa, this kid ain't satisfied with 
scoring a last minute winner away at Fulham. And then he wants to do, go doing that in the Champions League. He wants to do that for, 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 um, for Portugal in, in national to he, he just was, the bar was always just being raised and raised and raised. And like, even now when I chat to him on the phone, I sit there and he's, I couldn't even tell you some of the stuff that he moans about. And I'm thinking, bro, <laughs> you've cracked, you, you, you conquered the game. Like, you, you've clocked it. Like, but you're still worried about what people are saying or you're worried about, like, you're not getting the, the, the adulation or the, that you think you should be getting. And that's, but that's, again, that's the key to what drives people that is they're different. They're made different to all of us. Mm. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Just to hop back to Ravel Morrison, um, obviously he's had spells at Lazio, he's gone to Mexico, he's now at Sheffield United, mm. and I know your team kind of managed Chris Wilder. So what's the murmuring about why he isn't getting minutes at Sheffield United? I just think it's been unfortunate for him. Yeah, the, the, my management team, New Era, they look after Chris Wilder. Yeah. Um, and I did speak to Chris about Ravel when he, before he went there with, with Ravel's management as well. and just said, like, listen, the kid... You know my thoughts on the boy, but the problem I think that Ravel had probably there is that Sheffield United done so well, and sometimes it's difficult to get into a team when they, 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 they've got a formula that's working. Um, if I'm sitting there as a manager, why am I going to change that? Mm -hmm. So it's just, it was just, I think timing was probably wrong in the end. I don't think Chris Wilder probably expected his team to do as well as they did from the start. Um, but saying that if I was Ravel, I'd still be sitting there saying, well, at least put me on the sub, put me on the bench. I mean, if I was Ravel, that's how I'd be thinking as well. So it's a, it's a hard one to kind of, but I think both, both, both um, camps would have their, their, their good points of view to put forward as to why um, Ravel hasn't been playing. And Ravel would say, this is the reasons I should have been playing. Because I think you look at some of the clips in training, he's destroying some of the guys in that. <laughs> Fair point. Um, so, Ria, I, I wanted to ask you a, a question about, you know, some of the, uh, the titles that you've won. And I imagine it, it will probably be a difficult one because every one of those titles that you've won will have been important to you for a different reason. I should have had eight, not six. <laughs> <laughs> putting it out there. Um, if you could single out one of those trophies in particular as your standout one, the one that you're most proud of, which one would it be and why? The Premier League ones, yeah. Um, it's different. I can't answer that in one way. The first one was like, you know, like you just don't think you're ever going to get to the top of the mountain. You don't mm. think you're ever going to get there. I was at West Ham, never going to win a league at West Ham, as much as I loved it there. Leeds, you got closer, but then we just fell up, we tailed off at the end. Then come to Man United and just think, please, like after all the success they've had before, 99, etc., they hadn't won the league for two years. Please let me come in and help. Please, like, are they going to get it back? And I went there, won it the first year. But even then, it, asked, it, was, the, it was a great feeling. But when I reflected, like in the summer after that, I was sitting there thinking, I didn't feel like this is, I weren't, I weren't a really important member of this team. Like, if I didn't play the team, I don't know if they'd have missed me so much. Mm. I want to win this when I know that if I don't play, the team is sitting there going, I ain't the same no more. So that's like the, so. Then when we won it three back to back three times, that's when I felt, yeah, I felt at the top of my powers. I knew that like if I didn't play, the team would miss me. I was an integral member of that team, influential in that team, and it was probably the best satisfying feeling. And and then others, then then you move on to Sir Alex Ferguson's last one to win that of a squad that people were saying shouldn't have won it and weren't good enough and didn't have good enough great players. To win it like that and to shut people up with that squad was another different type of satisfaction. So it's different ways, really. Rio, um, obviously we'll come back to a bit more about your playing career at the end with the listener questions. But I wanted to move on a bit. And the question I want to ask you is, were there in any incidents in your career where you now look back on and you think, you know what, I should have spoken out there? For example, we had the watershed moment with um, Raheem Sterling where he hit out on his Instagram about the way players, black players, should I say, are represented in the media. Mm. Were there any incidents in your career where you feel I should have, I should have put a message out? Mm, it's different, it's difficult. Um, 
the Luis Suarez and Patrice Everett incident. Um, I think the not shaking his hand was a big step, was a big thing, because it, Patrice come to me that morning and said to me, "Rio, what should I do?" I said, "Listen, they're gonna have everyone watching you. Be the bigger man and shake his hand. Deal with it after, and go through the right channels." And Patrice, like a, a, a man, went to shake the shake the guy's hand, and he, he he didn't shake his hand, and then he went to shake my hand. Like, well, I ain't shaking your hand. You disrespect my friend. I ain't doing that. So I moved my hand. And, but that didn't really get the traction I think it should have got. And the, the people didn't speak about the reasons why. I mean, we maybe should have spoke more. And the John Terry and my brother situation, if I could rewind back the clock now, I would have spoke out from the day one and I said to my brother, speak now and say it because we were advised by, you have to remember there's lawyers in the background that represent us, that represent the club, that represent the Premier League, that represent the PFA, that represent the FA. So you've got all these different people talking and saying what's right, what's best for you, what's best for football, what's best for X, Y, and Z. And you get in this cloud and you're in this bubble and you're thinking, right, like, and then you just take on the professional advice and you think what's the best thing for, for everyone concerned because you don't want to be selfish in this situation. And you end up being quiet, staying in the background and hoping that it plays out the way that you think that it, when, like, it should if anyone looks at the situation, it should play out a certain way because you shouldn't think that facts are there for people to see. It's like, it will just happen. So what, are you and John Terry good now? No, no. Yeah. So, but the problem is, is that we we done it from a pure heart point of view. Our hearts are pure in this situation. So, but not everyone's like that. And when your heart's pure and you don't speak, you get punished. I've worked that out now. You get, you get, you're the ones who get punished and you're the ones who get tarnished and you're the ones who get labelled and whether that's because you're, you don't speak, whether because you're black, whether because you're, I don't know, but I just think it's, now I would speak straight away. My brother, I would say, speak, 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 speak. Big up, big up. Mm. So, and then it's the same even with my drug test. I didn't speak. I was told not to, don't speak because it will affect your case. It will affect your case. If I had the time now, I would speak because I know there's people out there probably think, oh, you must, you must have done something. But, if I had spoken, I don't think there'll be anyone with doubts now. But I've left it to the powers that be to, to, to use their common sense with the situation, but they, they didn't. Because I, there was people that had done the same as me, almost exactly identical to me, only months prior. And there was people that had done much far worse than me that didn't even get banned, let alone quarter of a million pound fines. So I was like, wow, they just, these people are just using me like a scapegoat. So yeah, like, and that's why I always pick up Raheem and anyone now where I think they've got the platform now. And it's different now as well. You have to remember you've got social media. So mm. like you've got a platform now where if Raheem wants to speak or anyone wants to speak on a situation, they've got a huge platform of voice to speak from so they can get their points across. It's not a reporter then interpreting what they've said or anything so it can get grey areas or, 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 or picked apart. No, no, no. I'm speaking. This is my mouth bank there for you to, to deal with. So, and you can address situations where that didn't happen before. But yeah, I'm, I think with experience, I would definitely not speak up. Yeah, so what I wanted to ask is, do you think there should be some sort of like BAME union to represent, you know, maybe all the ethnic minority groups going forward to create power that way? Mm, see, I don't know, man. We have this debate, and we have a couple of WhatsApp groups with all my friends, man. So this is when this get type of thing gets brought up a fair bit. I understand some people's need for it, but I don't like segregation. Mm. I don't like like the problem with racism and stuff like that. It is part part of that is segregating people, and I don't like it. So I would rather like Raheem, like and, and other players that they reach out to people like myself, to other players in the game and say, listen, you've had the experience, where could we go with this? What should we do? Because I understand that, I just think it creates another barrier. Do you know what I mean? It's hard. Mm -hmm. Listen, I understand the pros for it, but I also understand that there's, there's, there's negative side to the, these situations as well. But anything that creates segregation, I don't like it. I just, I just would rather steer away from segregation. I want the inclusive, where if, 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 if a white boy's got a problem, I want him to be able to come to, to talk. Do you know what I mean? If you've got a, a situation where you've got a, a union over there that's for black players only, 
well, what if there's, there's a black a white player over there is not a problem. We he should be able to come and talk as well. Mm. I mean, and come to the table. So I, I I think it should be a more open-minded union that's put together. And I, I, I and the problem is is that the that when there's these offences that have been done, the the actual kind of punishments have just been laughable and comical, and that's where the people become a little bit like disillusioned and stuff. So I won't say. Thanks. Sorry, my missus. No worries. <laughs> no problem. You said hi as well. <laughs> no, she's asking what I want for, for lunch. Um, yeah, so like, I don't know, the, the, race, the, race, the, the race, I think the players just, they need, what happened, I think the, the actual PFA and the Premier League need to, to, to find some, something in them, in their systems, in their unions, in their organisations where players can feel confident to go there that they're going to get looked after properly and a situation going to be dealt with properly. I think far too often that's not happening. Yes, so Rio, we've seen the class of 92 link up with Peter Lim, you know, by Salford City, and, mm. you know, have relative success, bringing them from the non-leagues to league football. Is football ownership like a step that you see yourself going down maybe sometime in the future? Maybe, you know, acquiring Dalich Hamlet? <laughs> 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 I don't know if them guys would sell. They've had problems, haven't they, selling? They, they, they won't sell, man. So, but um, yeah, I think in, in, in the future, I think right now I'm busy with a good few things, but in the future, that's something that I would look at. I, I've had an opportunity to be involved with an American team in terms of a franchise, but the timing was wrong. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting area, man. I mean, listen, it's, you have to be all in that situation if you're going to go and do it. You can't be having think hands in other pies too much um, but and you need a good team around you I think the guys the class of 92 have got a good team around them at the moment seems like they're doing really well so good luck to them fair fair play um, now on the topic of uh, haircuts and hairstyles Rio you um, you certainly uh, walked so that uh, someone like Paul Pogba could run in your day, you, 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 you had the one level trim, you had the, the dreads, you had the afro, you had the, the plaits and all the rest of it. Mm. Um, and what we see um, in, in the media now, you know, is, is, is someone like Paul Pogba, who, who is quite expressive with the way he dresses, with his hairstyles and whatnot. Um, he's often criticised, you know, uh, uh, Graham Souness, Danny Mills, have, uh, amongst others, have, have come out and criticised him um, because of it. Do you feel that the criticism he's received is is fair? Boy, he ain't even <laughs> played football this year. Like, I don't know how his name's in people's mouth. Like, he hasn't even played football. I don't understand it. Like, why are you trying yeah. to call Paul Pogba? Like, yeah. he didn't play this season, really. So, he, he, he shouldn't be in the conversation. Like, I don't understand. Yeah, he's a great player, huge profile. I understand all that, yeah? But... He's being he's being judged or made the villain in in, a situ, in this season that he's played really no part in. So I don't I don't get it. And I mean, obviously Graham Sunis made a, a statement about put your medals on the table. But boy, listen, mari has got a World Cup medal winners medal. Mm. Like yeah. hard to chat with someone. Who's got a World Cup. <laughs> Obviously, I think they think his career started when he was at Man United or something. Yeah, he won three or four like scudettos in Italy. Yeah, like, he's yeah not, Italy. Like, He's, he's won stuff. So, I know, listen, Graham Sunis is a great player and he's won a lot of stuff. But listen, and, and my generation, and even worse for Graham Sunis and all them guys' generation, they've they got to understand that these players don't look at them sometimes. They don't, understand, they don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. like for, for Paul Pogba to say he don't know who he is or wouldn't understand, know him as a footballer, I believe that. Like, it's not disrespectful. He don't know him. Mm -hmm. As great a player as Sunis was, he was a top player, one of the best. If he was talking about the best... British midfielders we've ever produced, he's in the conversation. 100% Graham Sunis is a bad player. <laughs> but Paul Pogba don't know. Mm. Simple as that. And that's just the difference of generations. So he won't, I don't think it's disrespectful. But listen, if I was Paul Pogba, I'd said the same thing. But I would have said it from a disrespectful standpoint because I've been saying, you've been dissing me all this time. I've not kicked the ball. Why are you talking about me for? <laughs> so... And I listen, and I'm honest with about, about Paul because I, I, and I love Paul because he's a great kid. I've known him since he was a young boy and I still chat to him now. But like, the only problem I have with Paul is that I just think he should chat instead of his agent chatting. 
if he'd done that, there'd be more clarity on the whole situation. So, Have you told him that, Rio? Yeah, I spoke to him about all that type of stuff. But Paul's his own man and going to deal with it his own way. And I respect that. That's fine. So that's the only thing I'd say. But And then would Paul be... Would Paul want to, wanted to do more in a Man United shirt in terms of performances? I'm sure he would. Listen, this kid's an absolute professional, desperate to be the best player in the world. He wants to be that. That don't ever get that twisted. But these guys are like talking about him like he's some like fairground player or person who wants to just do, just because. Listen, it's taken me time to adjust, yeah. But I used to find it hard to see players smiling in the tunnel or players like dancing in the changing room or dancing. Uh, if, if, they're not in, if they're injured and they're out darting somewhere, like Paul was, these guys are going mad about it. Like, he should be in his home hibernating and not doing anything <laughs> in his life. Like, his life's got to stop. Like, no, it's not like that. Mm. Everyone's different. I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have been doing what, what Paul's doing. But I understand what he's doing because that's taking his mind off being injured. That's just doing other stuff. Mm. It's getting his mind from being in a depressive state. I know players that just shut themselves off once they were injured. They would become depressed. Louis Saha, depressed, scared to talk to anyone about anything. Do you, want, do you want someone like that to be like that? Or do you want them to still have their personality, still remain on top of the world and thinking, look, I can't wait to get back and bubbly and stuff? I'd rather that. I'd rather what Paul's doing. You may not like seeing that, but that's, that's him. That's his life. You can't control that. That's wrong. Rio, there's been, you know, reports um, emanating that, you know, Phil Neville is going to, you know, step down as the women's um, England national team manager. Would you be interested in that role or is that something that will interest you? No. No. I'm not, I, don't, I wouldn't be a manager in, my, in the men's game, let alone the women's game. So not right now. It, it wouldn't suit my lifestyle. Mm. Okay, so Rio, what I wanted to do is, you know, take this conversation to England. Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about the golden generation, not gelling, the cliques and stuff like that. But I want to dial into the moment where, you know, in South Africa, when you had that collision with Emil Heskey, which ruled you out of the, you know, World Cup, when you were set to captain it, captain England, should I say. So how was that moment? Well, it's one of it's like... Is that your biggest low point? One of, yeah, like, because obviously, like, it's a big thing, but captain in the country to the, to the World Cup, like, it's, that's like, that's dream stuff, man. Um, and, yeah, I, I just remember when it happened, I just laid there straight away, I knew, I just knew. Because uh, I never had injuries, really, until that point. I just knew then, straight away, that's it. I got in, the, I remember getting in the ambulance, and... The guy was there. The man was asking me for my shirt and everything. I was thinking, well, I'm not going to play in the World Cup when you're asking me about my shirt and all grass and stuff like that. I said, listen. And then he, I just said to the, when I got there and I said to the, the, um, the operating um, surgeon, I said, listen, is there, what do you think when you see the scan? And he just shook his head. He said, you haven't got time to get back. And I was just, that was just, I was just broken, man. But I know I, it wasn't a good thing, but something happened at that moment. You know, I was sitting in the, in the A&E area in South Africa in this hospital with the, with the team doctor. And I was obviously like depressed, like emotional, just thinking like my life's over. And then someone come through on a big um, bed, rushing and rushing, all these medics come through and the guy was more or less like dying on this bed. And it kind of put things into perspective. Mm, you know, I just thought, you know what? I'm alive, man. Just like, it's a disappointment. That's it. It's no bigger than that. So, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a mad one. And Emil, man, he, his big self just fell on me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. Um, next question I wanted to ask Rio is, um, you know, when we put out the tweet and we were asking for listeners' questions, Mm. Um, one very, very common question um, that we had was um, something to do with um, your partnership with, um, with Vidic. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask, so this is also like a, a, like a two-part question, um, because one, on, on one hand, people were asking, like, what was it about your partnership that clicked so well? Why did you guys uh, uh, form such a formidable partnership? Um, but two, I think there was load of, loads of uh, Liverpool uh, fans who, uh, who, who came in with this question. And it was always about um, playing against Fernando Torres. 
of course, I imagine you've been asked this question quite quite a few times. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was it was Gerard when he um, caught up with uh, Phil Neville, and it was and he was speaking about playing against United back in the day, and 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 they spoke about he spoke about um, focusing on Vidic because they um, you know they felt that he was the the, the weaker link to us mm. to some degree. So mm. did you guys, you and Vidic, ever have conversations around that about how you would negate um, that that tactic deployed by Liverpool? First of all, it's the best partnership ever in Premier League history. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah, right. so we had Sylvan Distan on and he said exactly the same thing. Yeah. That he used to look at you two and think, if I could reach that level, then I would have done myself proud. Listen, like, the strikers were playing out on the wing sometimes because they didn't want to come against us. It was mad. <laughs> but, it was, um, sometimes you get against, like, there's always going to be that one player in your career who's difficult. He might not be the best player on the planet yet, but he's just, his style is made to hurt your style. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And Torres might have just been that for, for Nemanja, that he's someone he found difficult um, to play against. Um, and he's probably the only player who I've seen consistently give Vida a hard time. Um, and he got sent off in a couple of the games, didn't he? Like, early on in the games. Um, but, I don't know, Torres, listen, Torres is a great player. And he was like, in his pump when he's in Liverpool, he's one of the best strikers about. He was like a devastating striker. Um, but I, with me, one and B one, he, he didn't cause me no problems really, if I'm honest. But it's just that's the way it is. Like one of my hardest strikers to play against when people ask me, other than the ones that are obvious, like the Ronaldos or the Messi's, etc., Kevin Davis. Like, you would never expect that. Like, he was always tough to play against me. Always caused me most problems. Like he always was physical, was yeah. just just obstructing you all the time. The ball might be over there, but he's grabbing you and all this stuff. Like so. There's different, you would never expect that. So, but Torres was, would have been that for Nemanja, probably. So, um, but we never really spoke about it. It's mad. Our relationship, we, we, we spent a lot of time with each other after training, in and around the training ground, just chatting about loads of stuff here. But it wasn't about our relationship on the pitch. Mm. It wasn't like, Vida, you know, when you go tight with, with Suarez, I'm going to be behind covering. And it was nothing like that. Never spoke like that at all. But our relationship was just like, you just, I could, it was just, I don't know, it was just something in the air that I knew he was going to go there. If he went there, I was here. If I went there, he was there. Do you know what I mean? So, and that's the way in getting in partnerships in the game are not necessarily built just on a training pitch. I think it's just sometimes it's just, it's just you're blessed that someone just come into your life at that time and you manage to be able to be at the same time and it's just come together just like that. And that's what we had, man. And, as I said to you, like, I just I could see sometimes in the tunnel strikers that looking at me or looking at Vida and thinking, mm, I don't know if I'm going to play it right up against them too. I'm going to go out wide and try and get some balls out there or go deep, go and play in the midfield area. So <laughs> it was, and that's a nice feeling. But at the same time, because I used to want to play football and play, 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 I used to come off. If you got to speak to Nanya Vidic, he used to laugh at me sometimes because I used to be going mad in the tunnel. This is rubbish, man. We're, he's like, what's wrong here? We just won 3 0. So I didn't touch the ball. It's a good game for us. I said, no, and I want the ball, man. I want to pass. I'm getting involved. But that's how it was sometimes. And again, like people talk about partnerships in the Premier League. I, I, I don't see another partnership coming close to our partnership. Rio, if you had to put on your non bias hat, um... I want to, what's, what's your thoughts on Virgil van Dijk? Because I want you to, would you say he's a similar player to how you were? He loves having the ball. And obviously he's also a great 1v1 defender and he has the pace, you know, and just the ability to do whatever he wants on the football pitch. Mm. How highly do you rate him, one? And if you had to rank your top five centre-backs, excluding yourself in Premier League history, who would the five be? Yeah, I think he's, I love him. I think he's the best in the world right now. He's like, he's like, undoubtedly, I think he's a top player. I think he's not fighting against the, the, the depth of other central defenders that was probably in my era. If, if we were talking about top, top draw centre-halves, I could name five, six, seven, eight, nine in my era, where I can only name, not even, I don't think I've been up my hand in this era at the moment. So, and that's no disrespect, but I'm talking like the top players. So, like, I think he's, I think in any era, he looks a top player. Um, 
I'd, what only thing I would like is oh, it's, it's very different. The game's a bit different now. I would like to see him playing against two strikers, up against two players, and having to deal one v one all the way for ninety minutes, back week to week. Do you know what I mean? Like for instance, are you looking like in when I'm, I was playing, you're playing against like you're always like two strikers all the time. Do you know what I mean? A lot of the time you play against two strikers or a striker with one off, just dropping behind all the time. Whereas now you've got one striker and you've got two wide. The fullbacks take care of the wide man and you've got two of you in the middle taking care of one player. So you get time to breathe, you get time to relax a little bit, you get time to let your other partner handle him for a bit, etc. So it's, it's different. I'd love to see him in that environment. Um, but I think he'd handle it still. Um, but I'd just be interested to see him handle it at a top level like that. It'd be good. Um, but I think in any area, he stands tall amongst them players. And I think that if I was naming a top five centre-halves, I think Vidic, Company, Terry, Van Dyke, Campbell. They'd be my five, probably. Who got me sat there? Ledley King, but he had his injury problems. Ledley... Ledley it's like if, buts and maybes, isn't it? If Ledley was fit, who knows what would happen, but on ability, he was up there with anyone. He was like a top player, top, 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 top player. But it's just unfortunate with injuries, man. So you can't put him in that category when the injuries have kind of did, like, killed his career a little bit. What about Keown as well? Yeah, you... Stan, he was putting people Ooh, on the yeah. floor. Oh, jeez. Yaps in there. I forgot, I forgot. Yaps in there. So I don't know who's coming out. I can't. I can't. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so Rio, like assessing the state of the game, obviously you played in some top, top quality games, high tempo, high intensity. When you look at this current generation or this current crop of players, how do you match up the two generations? Do you think your standard was better or this standard was better? I think the game's quicker now. Yeah. I think defending was better back then, definitely. But the attacking now is, is easily on a par, if not better, um, in terms of, like, it's devastating now, man, especially when you look at Champions League as well. Like, it's a chance goal most of the time. Um, but I don't like to compare eras, really. It's difficult to do that, do you know what I mean? But I don't know, man. If you look at it, I'll ask you a lot of questions. Are the strikers better now? Or the strikers better then? Now let's go through it. If you if you look in the strikers now, you've got Aguero, Abamian, Kane, um, Salah, Mane, Firmino, Son, etc. Who else? Suarez. Suarez. Like, I'm talking Premier League right now, yeah? Okay, yeah. And then and then you've got like back in say my time, you've got like Drogba, Van Persie, Henri, Burkamp, um, Cole, York. Sholska, Sheringham, mm. like mm. Shearer, Robbie Fowler. Like, I can go on, like, there's even more. I think the depth before, there's a lot more depth in terms of the top strikers. Like, you look at the England squad now, and you look at the England squad from before. If you were to name the strikers, they reel off a bit quicker in my area than they do now in terms of top, top quality. Mm. So it's just a difference. I think there's more, there's more, there was more volume before, but there's still class now. I think another question that we had was how, what's been difficult about the transition from going from a player to a pundit? Because, you know, at times pundits can be rash and criticise players for performances without knowing what's happening in their private life. So what's been the biggest difficulty transitioning from being a player to a pundit? And do you feel that because you were a player, you have that empathy with players when they're not playing well? Yeah, I feel I've got that empathy, but I feel I just have to be honest. Like, I've got to say what I see. Like, as long as I'm not being vindictive and I'm not being personal to, some, to a player, I, I feel very comfortable saying if they've played bad or not. I think it's, that's all I'm there to do. I'm not there to talk about, like, anything else, really. I'm just there to say what, what's happening in the 90 minutes. Or if there's other stories that have come out, I can draw opinions on it. But I'm never going to be personal to somebody. Um, like I spoke about Lingard and Pogba before dancing that. I'm not being personal. That's just not my taste. That's what I said at the time. Yeah. So, but it's not personal. Nothing's ever personal with me. Like, it's always like, if they've not been good enough. I always think about it. When I was a player, yeah. If I saw a pundit hammering me, 
I would have known before that man speaking if I've been good or bad. So no, there ain't nothing you can say about my performance here, yeah? unless he's getting personal, that's really going to hurt me. And that's how I think about being a pundit. I ain't going to say nothing personal, but I'm going to tell you if you've done something wrong. And you should be man enough to go, you know what, well, I knew that anyway, and I accept that, because that's normal. Yeah, fair play. Um, Rio, I wanted to ask you a quick question. And um, essentially, it's off the back of the fact that players' salaries in this day and age are always in the, in the press and in the media in some way, shape or form, right? Um, of course, most recently, as um, in response to the COVID-19 situation and, and, and uh, the support and help that um, the NHS needs. And I, what I wanted to ask you is, um, if you were playing in this day and age, do you think you would have um, been as motivated and as determined and as focused as you had been previously uh, if you were earning those, those sort of wages that we see players earning now early in your career? And we also see like the commercial aspect of, of players' careers uh, play more and more importance now. Um, with players having to sort of build their brands off the, off the pitch as well. Um, so, of course, some people will argue and say that it's a bit of a distraction. But if you were playing in this day and age, do you think both the whole commercial aspect of, of your brand um, and, and the, 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 the kind of salaries that players are earning now would have stopped you from, you know, being as focused as, as you were in your time? Listen, I earned a lot of money, so I was lucky, yeah. But it's like... I didn't play football. When I was on my estate, on Friary Estate, I didn't play football. I started playing football for money. I played because I loved football. Mm. I would have played for nothing anyway. I was just lucky that this profession I loved paid big money. So I was lucky in that sense. And no matter how much I earned, that didn't really, like, that wasn't my marker as how good a player I am. It was all just about working hard and playing and trying to get to goals that I set myself. And the money will just, it will, it will come. It's fine. Mm. And then I can do what I want with like helping my family and stuff. But it wasn't the motivation for me wasn't financial. It wasn't about money. Um, and I just I, I just thought if I play well, the money will come anyway. So mm. that was just all the focus was on football. Where like we're in a different climate today. It's different with social media. What these kids see now, like I didn't see John Barnes and Ian Wright's cars and his home life and what his house looked like and the, for me to start wanting that. I just saw what he was doing on a football pitch during the ninety minutes, and that's what I wanted to be like. So it's very different. So I get why some of these kids are just walked with like all of the materialistic things of what it's about, and that's their obsession. But they've got to try and stay away from that because that will be their that's the will chip them up in the end, and will stop them getting to their target if they focus too much on what's there rather than what's going to get them there. Um, but in terms of the commercial side of it, that I'm very much of the the, the thinking when I played, social media was just coming in, and they're like. I waited till I was winning and I waited till I was very comfortable and confident that I knew training what I needed to do, rest what I needed to do, recovery what I needed to do. So that if I was doing commercial activities and, and doing a lot of commercial stuff here and there, that if someone questioned me or the manager or the CEO come to me and said, what are you doing this for work? I could comfortably say, I train as well as anyone. I'm never injured. I'm always, always, um, my, I'm consistent in my performance. We're winning. Like, there's no problem. Mm. But I, feel, I just get, I, I get a little bit not annoyed, but I feel well. Listen, slow down. When you've got the young guys that are trying to run before they can walk, they're not even regulars in their team, like, and they're trying to do big commercial, this, that, and the other. And I think, listen, your focus shouldn't be there yet. That's mm. going to come. Wait till your 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 season a little bit. There's a bit too many unseasoned people doing stuff that I think it's, you don't need to do that. Yeah, so Rio, I wanted to, you know, go back to your Man United days or the current Man United days, should I say. There's a player, Marcus Rashford. Mm -hmm. I remember at a stage, people were comparing him to Mbappe. Mm -hmm. Then obviously Mbappe shot to, you know, superstardom and Rashford had his own little setbacks. And now he's sort of catching up and we've seen him on the Oli this season putting in some devastated performances. How good can this guy be? Rashford could be like up there the best, 100%, because he's just got a mad talent. He's just a, a from a kid I've seen him play, um, whether it was up front or wide or drifting about, he's always had mad talent. And Man United, within the corridors of Man United, they've always known. Um, it's whether you can translate that to being in the first team, and he's shown that he can do that. It's just what he needs now 
he's just been unfortunate here. He's, he's in a team that's been in transition for every ever since he's been in the first team. So it's very different to say Mbappe coming into a Paris Saint-Germain team that's going to win every year, he's fighting for trophies on all fronts. So the confidence levels are there. There's not no finding out period with any of the players. They're a consistent, well-oiled machine in their league. So it's very different. And that league's not as hard either. But Mbappe's like major, major. So, <laughs> but Rashford, I just think that if it seemed like Oli was getting the consistency in the squad and that was when he weren't playing, which was the disappointing part. So... Fingers crossed things get back to normal and he can come back into some consistency and they can start trying to really get back to the heights that May United were at before. And then I think we'll see even more out of Marcus because if I'm May United, I'm building it all around him. So what do you think about Bruno Fernandes as well? He's coming, you know, he's put in some consistent performances. We were speaking to Flex and he said he watches the games and he sees him up close and personal, pointing to play, saying, no, you go there. I'm going to play this ball over top over the top make sure you're there so what do you think about the contribution he's brought to this Man United team and do you think he's someone looking from the outside that could have hung with your team back in your day um, I think for Rashford I think he's perfect I think Rashford cries out for someone like that I think Pogba at times has shown it with when they had that little telepathy where he gets the ball he doesn't even have to look Rashford's running and they've, like I was talking about relationships before if Rashford and, and uh, Bruno Fernandes can build that relationship where once the ball, they win the ball back, Marcus just gets on his bike and, and Fernandes will find him. Um, if that starts getting going, then God help any defender. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, listen, I think it's too early to start judging Bruno on could he play in different areas of Man United's great teams. I think it's too early. Let him breathe, let him play and then let's see after a year, another year or two. Rio, obviously, we're going through a global crisis at the moment and you know the the hierarchy at Man United have come, come under a lot of criticism I mean Ed Woodward and Matt Judge they're being heavily criticized for you know focusing on the commercial element of things but do you think in a situation like this this is where Ed Woodward and Matt Judge should be praised and they've put Man United in a strong, strong position um, and they're doing well financially also who would be the three players that you think Man United should sign um, in the summer? Yeah, I think they've dealt with the whole COVID situation um, better than most for uh, Manchester United. I think they haven't done any, anything knee-jerk. Um, they've held their own counsel and then they've made decisions that within the walls of Manchester United and not been pressurised by no one else, which is good. Um, and I think Woodward and my judge need to be definitely commended for that. Um, and yeah, financially, Man United are in a stronger position than most again because of the way that the club is structured. Um, but if Man United were going to buy three players, I think he, every week this changes. Do you know what I mean? It's mad. But um, if I was going to buy three, I'd definitely buy Sancho. Could you imagine Sancho in that team here yeah, with like, I don't know, like he draws two or three players to him and then Rashford's playing 1v1. Oh God, it's over. Um, I would, I would maybe go and get Partey from Atletico Madrid Ooh, yeah. or, or NDD from Leicester. Um, I like Sal Niguez. He's a very, very good player in midfield. And then I think a centre-back, I do think they, they still need a centre-back. Um, whether you go for a young one, like a Ben Godfrey, or you go for someone like Koulibaly, I don't know, it's difficult. Yeah, so Rio, um, obviously we're going through this global crisis, as Dot said. There's been talks about how the season should be ended. We've seen in the National League, you know, they've cancelled it. This Premier League season, how should it be resolved, in your opinion? Rio, yeah, if uh, I end it. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. You know what? It's nothing to do with Liverpool, seriously. People think that when I said that, that's what it was about. I, just, I was just saying, this is bigger than football. 100%. But like there's people dying, like, and, and we're worrying about like, the league finishing and ending, and, and should it stay on, or, or is it because of our rivalry with Liverpool? Why I'm, say I'm, not, I'm not saying it because I'm saying it for one reason that like, we have to think about people's safety before anything. So if people's safety are going to be in jeopardy at any point, then you've got to just say, listen, whoever's winning or whoever's losing, whatever's going on, this has got to just be folded until next season. So that's, that's been my standpoint. If the situation 
starts um, getting better for everybody and the, 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 the virus starts declining, then yeah, 100% the season should get up and going when it's right. But at the moment, I don't see a way where the season can really get going again. I, I, I just can't because the National League have made that decision. Um, and listen, they wouldn't have done that without holding counsel, without talking, without having dialogue with the right people to make that decision. And I think it's going to probably have a knock-on effect. It will come later. And I think that the higher leagues go higher will probably at some point end up having to do the same if the situation doesn't improve as quick as we would like. Because I'm a football fan. I want to see it finish. I'd like to see the season finish. I don't want this not to finish. But again, this is a bigger situation than just football. So what's the talk at BT? Are they preparing to, you know, air the rest of the Premier League? Or are they sort of airing on the side of caution thinking, you know what, the season might have to get scrapped? Listen, I, I, BT are a, a great company and, and they'll, they'll want to be doing what's best for the country in turn, as a whole rather than thinking about themselves or football. Football is um, definitely way down on the list in terms of priorities for everybody, I think at the moment, I just think it's like, it's a great thing where we're talking like this, it keeps our minds off of the serious situation sometimes, and it's great, we all love the game and keep talking about it, it keeps everyone connected, but when it comes to what's gonna happen, I think BT will be very much guided by the government and the, the powers that be within football. And Ria, sorry, last one for me very quickly. I think, <laughs> we know how serious the situation is and we fully understand, but I think people's, um, you know, people saying that the league should end, they're saying, how can you be focusing on next season when this season ain't finished? So whether it takes six months to finish off this season, that will be it. And then we focus on next season. Yeah, there's, there's different ways to do this, isn't it? There's going to be, I think that's, that's, the, that's the question and that's why the powers that we need to get around the table and come to that decision, I think is. But I think then decisions can only start being made when they know when the actual virus is starting to come on a decline. When they've got the virus under control, then they, they can have these conversations. Actually, let's finish the season, delay next season, or vice versa. So it can be cut up and chopped up different ways. I think mm -hmm. just, again, we've just got to play the waiting game. Fair play. And uh, Rio, just obviously to, to, to wrap up, um, of course, we've got to ask the question, um, what, what's next for you? You know, I, we know that you've, you've, you've done your coaching badges at the moment. You're doing some work with, uh, with, with BT Sport and, and, and also as part of um, B, uh, BT's 433 initiative, uh, which is obviously uh, aiming to bring more women, young people and uh, disadvantaged people into the game. Um, I know you also do a bit of mentorship and, uh, and that kind of thing as well. Um, and, and, you know, naturally, as you, as you mentioned at the start of the interview as well, you've got your, your kids to look after and, and you, you, you know you've got a very very busy life at, at, at the moment. Um, what what is next for you? Have, have you have you thought about it? You know the next what the next sort of five or ten years looks like in in the life of uh, Rio Ferdinand? Um, not really. I think I to continue and doing what I'm doing at the moment. I mean, my, them plans could change. I think um, fitness is something that I'm really into at the moment, and like health and well being. I think it's huge, especially under these current circumstances. I think the health and well-being, mental state of mind as well is a huge thing to kind of get people in the right frame of mind, the right body. Mm. Um, so I don't know. It's, 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 I'm, I'm kind of open. I, I, I love my role in the game at the moment because I'm still in it. I'm doing what we're doing now all the time, chatting to people about football, which is what I'd do if I weren't on BT anyway. So, mm. But again, like my current personal situation, the way things have panned out, um, my, my wife and kids are really the focal point of yeah. what I do. Yeah, so Rio, just find the one from me. Obviously, there's three golden players in the generation of England. You know, the central midfielders, Gerard, Lampard and Scholes. I know you might have a vested interest <laughs> in Scholes, so I'm going to narrow it down to two. I know you're cool with them both. But Gerard or Lampard? Hard, man. If I wanted to, win, if I wanted to go and win a game... I don't know, man. It's hard, isn't it? <laughs> you know what? If, if, if I was a fan going to watch a game, I'd pay to watch Gerard. If I was a manager, I'd probably pick Lampard. Lampard gets me 20 goals a season every year. I think he'd done that for like five or six, seven years. 20 goals from midfield a season. Ain't ever been seen before. Won't be seen again. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
But then, then Stephen Gerrard was like Roy the Rovers. When it mattered in the big games, he just popped up and scored and dragged his team over the line. So there's great arguments for both players, man. They're both great. They should have been able to play together for England. Yeah, we are. That's, I no, guess big up yourself, man. Big up, big up, big up. Go and have a row on, 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 on that topic in itself. Yeah. Well, I know. No, no Rio, <laughs> big up yourself, man. It's, it's been an absolute privilege and we would love to do this in person. We were meant to do it in person, but obviously yeah. this pandemic <laughs> took charge. Yeah. Rio, this was meant to be like a hundredth ep, but because of everything that's going on, mm. we decided to, you know, push it forward. So hopefully we can meet up in person and do it again. And I'll keep yeah. in touch with you as well, yeah? Oh, yeah. cool, definitely, definitely. When it's over, we chat again. Yeah, man. Right. Real. Oh, thanks, Love. Bro. Thank you very much for your no, time. Good luck, man. Good luck, guys. Send me the details, yeah, for that. To, like, push it out there and stuff. Oh, big up, right. Rio, man. Love, 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 love. love, love. love. Take care. Take care, Rio, bro. Bye. Bye. All right, listeners, there you have it. Uh, you heard from the man himself. We're going to call it a day there. Thank you very much for listening in and viewing in up until this point in time. Uh, a reminder that if, you're not, if you've not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, make sure you do. Yeah, like this episode, said, Budge, this episode is... We told you we're going to be bringing out <laughs> content on the YouTube channel for you to stay occupied and keep yourself busy over this period of time. So if you haven't yet listened and heeded my advice, I'd say do so right now. Subscribe. The, U- the Beautiful Game podcast. Uh, make sure you, uh, you, you watch these visu- visuals and there's still more coming. Watch yeah. this space. Yeah, Budge, might... I think this, Budge, I think this episode is going to go on YouTube before any other platform. Yeah, so yeah. That's don't that's don't the miss plan. the trick. So there's no, We're probably so going to do like a one premiere one. for it. We'll do a premiere so everyone can enjoy it together because, you know, the gems that Rio was dropping were absolutely crazy. And I think this episode should be, you know, our flagship. Yeah, 100%. I, I certainly echo that sentiment, Dej. Um, also, just a reminder before we uh, sign off, if you're not yet following us on Twitter, please make sure you do at podcast underscore TVG. You can also follow us on Instagram at pod underscore TVG. And we already mentioned that we're going to be um, launching this on YouTube first, but then we're going to follow up with all of the other platforms that we usually put our content out on. So you can listen to the episodes on Spotify, SoundCloud, and on Apple Podcasts as well. And as ever, if you are listening in on Apple Podcasts, please make sure you leave a five-star review so you can help us continue to move our platform and product forward. We really, really appreciate you guys and thank you so much for all of your questions um, and, and for listening in. Honestly, guys, if we had enough time, we would have asked, um, asked all of the questions that you guys sent in. Of course, um, given the fact that we were strapped for time, we couldn't answer um, or ask all of them. So just wanted to apologise um, to you guys on, um, on behalf of the whole team for that. But stay tuned, stay locked. Bigger, bigger and better things coming. Dot, am I, am I all good? Yeah, yo, yeah, all good, bro. We had real fair than that, man. It's crazy. That's, that's oh, man. Yes, man. Oh, it's I'm just, crazy, yeah, man. it's mad. Crazy. Right, we're going to leave it there then, guys. Until the next episode, over and out. Peace.